Video from our boy, Nick Crowley. The children's TV show with a dark secret. Chat, no flipping swears, dude. We're trying to get this monetized. Oh, it's for Iron King? That's real. That's real. All right. All right, let's tap in. And it'll be worth 20 points. 20 points. Oh. Following video includes scenes. No doubt. Maybe we do some as we go. Okay. Nick Crowley presents. It's 8 a.m. sharp on a Saturday morning in 1979. Families in the Tampa Bay area turn on their television sets as thousands of- 1979, dude? Who remembers this? Father Time? Huh? Is that who remembers? 1979, dude? What the heck, dude? Sleepy children awake on their day off from school. <laughs> Some flip to Nickelodeon where a rerun of Pinwheel is playing. Some flipped to ABC, where they would catch the final episode of a short-lived TV series called Fang Face. Called Freak Face. Love it. Suck toes. However, that morning, others would opt for a more virtuous wake-up call, flipping the station instead to Channel 22, or the Christian Television Network, oh, no, where you. a new show was opening the day slate. A show called... The show Joy Junction quickly found its place in the hearts of viewers, with kids immediately connecting with the quirky characters and silly games. Their Christian parents, too, found solace in the show's themes and non-offensive stories, creating a program that could be experienced together as a whole family. Nah, I'm not interested, bro. The reason why I watch SpongeBob is for the freaky references, like when he's watching, you know, crazy stuff on his TV, getting real excited, like, and then he's like, he's like, oh, get and he switches it off. You know, I like little references like this. What are they going to reference here, huh? Moses? Huh? They're going to reference Moses? Do you think they're going to reference Noah getting freaky with his son's wives? Huh? You think that's what they're going to... They're going to sort of reference somewhere in here? Some some dark humor? Huh? Um, Great DB, we're watching the children's TV show with a dark secret. That's what we're watching by Nick Crowley. Pepsi, but my drunk dad, how they're talking about his sad life, and I ain't going, I ain't got that energy for that, oh, that's real, that's real, oh, I think I know the story, it's sad, okay, my bad, and the, yo, you're doing what tomorrow? From that day on, families all across Florida, and eventually across the entire United States, came to enjoy the program, which continued on for a run of over 20 long years, uh -oh. until one Saturday morning, uh oh, the Christian channel, this has a sad ending, all right, I'm already. All right. Did, did they have flipping Dr. Disrespect on here? Is that what I'm gathering? Dude, I'm trying to be real. I'm trying to do the little, uh, you know, the, what's the word I'm looking for here? The, 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 like they do with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, like I was saying with SpongeBob, like stuff that'll go over a lot of people's heads, but like some people will get, that's what I'm trying to do to make sure this video gets monetized right now with my jokes that I'm cracking. At 8 a.m. sharp, when, without explanation, the show came to an unceremonious end and was never broadcast again. What? Uh-oh. Today, the show and all official records of it have been scrubbed from the internet, with the companies behind its creation and the networks that aired it acting as if it never even existed. What? Some allegedly going as far as to destroy any remaining copies, thanks solely to the heinous events that transpired during and after its television run. This is the story of Joy Junction, the children's TV show with an unimaginably dark secret. We'll return after these messages. One of the most frustrating things to me is spam phone calls and spam texts. There was a point in my life where I swear every single day I was getting these texts from random numbers that were dude. all trying to get me to click on sketchy links that if I clicked on them likely would have hacked my entire existence. And I know the main reason why I used to get so many texts like this was because- I just want to say I've been on Nick Crawley's stuff for a while, bro, okay? Used to watch his stuff all the time when I'd play Madden, okay? I'd be watching weird videos and stuff, I'd be chilling there. Taking the Niners to their ninth consistent Super Bowl, okay? With 52-year-old Tom Brady, okay? I'd be listening to him, okay? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of legendary. What can I say? These huge companies can't keep our data safe. Recently, Ticketmaster was hacked, and the data of over 500 users... Flip Ticketmaster! Users. Unless they want to hire me to be... Wait, actually, it'd be Live Nation. Flip Ticketmaster! 
Sorta. Was stolen and sold onto the dark web. That data includes full names, addresses, email addresses, phone numbers, and credit card data. At absolute best, this is gonna lead to so much more spam, and at worst, it could lead to fraud. So what is Ticketmaster doing Boss about man. this? Well, nothing. They said they didn't think the hack would have a material impact on their overall business. What? I swear, so many of these big businesses will happily take our data, but then do absolutely nothing to protect it. Which is exactly why I use Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura alerts me when my data has been part of a data breach or yeah, same Chucky. the dark web. It also gives me fast fraud alerts if anyone tries to use that data to hack into my credit or bank accounts. And it removes my information from data broker websites so I get less spam. I also get things like transaction monitoring, a VPN, antivirus, a password manager, parental controls, and identity theft insurance. And best of all, I get it in one convenient app at one affordable price. So if my info had been compromised in that Ticketmaster League, I wouldn't have much to worry about because Aura is always on and always working hard to keep me safe. I'm not leaving myself and my family vulnerable to data breaches. And if you don't want to either, then go on over to Aura.com slash Nick Crowley. Sorry, dude. I'm not, listen, I'm not as bad as Dark Viper AU makes me out to be. Okay, I'm gonna let Nick Crowley get his bag and I would feel bad skipping it considering the fact we're reacting to his video. Okay, so we gonna let him... We gonna let him run it up. Where you can try your first two weeks absolutely free just by following that link down below. I was responding to what Storming sent me. Come and join us for a half hour of fun and games at Joy Junction. Now here's Sheriff Don. Thank you and welcome to this fun little town of Joy Junction. Man, I would destroy this show just for the bad audio. Joy Junction was both the name of the show and the name of the fictional town in which it was focused. A town where numerous characters converged to tell stories, play games, and answer questions, all of which pertaining to Christianity. Each episode followed the same basic structure. They were 30 minutes long and would tackle one general lesson taught in the Bible and tell it through an acted out story. This was then interspersed with various games and audience participation as the show heavily leaned on including its young fan base and immersing them in the world of Joy Junction. They even had a live studio audience for every episode, comprised of kids ages 3 to 13, with the participants and crowd genuinely seeming ex Oh, so it's like my Twitch chat. Okay, I get it. ...excited to be there, which was largely due to its lovable cast of characters. The most prevalent of- My type of hairline, by the way. Here, let me just go back here. Hold on. ...its lovable cast of- My type of hairline, for real. Characters. The most prevalent of these was Sheriff Don, who was actually played by the creator of the show itself, Don McAllister. And the whole game you had a VHS of this show? Here, so we're going to have us a good time today. Glad you could join us for the next 30 minutes. He guided the show from segment to segment and often focused on the Bible while driving home the episode's central theme, while also being the one who most often interacted with the children who participated in the show. Then there was Forrest Padley, a soft-spoken professor who, ironically, often had lessons taught to him due to his obvious clueless nature. Put your bubble. He'll even help when you did wrong. Uh, I'm not a pope, but how about, how about he'll even help when you're in trouble? Hey, Sheriff Don, you're a poet too. <laughs> and of course, the fan favorite, Whitler Dan, a caricature of a southern farmer known as the goofy storyteller of the group. Good, yeah. Oh, hi. I'm just sitting here reading some of the mail from Joy Junction and uh, some of the jokes in here. Would you like me to read some more? Oh, okay. <laughs> this, no, wait. I don't, no, I don't even want, nope. I was going to say, this guy's me, right? Because uh, he's Southern and he's got a big beard and all that. But, uh, you know, I don't know what, what went wrong with this show. So I do not want to attach myself to any of these entities, okay? <laughs> Talking about them like they're a Backrooms character. Mm -mm. This entity, not me for real, no. But of all the characters to come from Joy Junction, uh -oh. there was one or two who were by far the most popular oh. yet polarizing. Oh. Ron and Marty. Uh-oh. Played by professional ventriloquist Ronald Williams, Ron and Marty were far and away the most memorable characters for those who watched the show, and for obvious reasons too. Many children watching at home found the duo, and Marty specifically, to be off-putting, even horrifying, with some claiming that the doll gave them nightmares and was just- They compared this show to Pee Wee Herman's show? That's crazy. Just too creepy to look at, causing many to stop watching the show altogether. But despite this, others found the duo to be hilarious and entertaining, tuning in week after week just to see them perform. For the viewers, it was a love or hate relationship with Ron and Marty. But even so, it was impossible to dismiss their impact on the show. They appear in every single episode that we have available today. 
and they were often tasked with teaching the children some of the series' most important version. lessons. Lessons like not to cuss. But things like on here and a lot of swear words. All the kids are using swear words these days. And I'm afraid one of them's gonna slip out of none now. First of all, why don't you try immediately praying and asking the Lord to take those bad words and thoughts out of your mind. Say, that's a good idea. Practicing self-control. Self-control? Oh. Well, I don't think my self-control works. It must be broken. <laughs> no, well, no, Marty. I don't think anybody can practice self-control all by themselves. But if you'll just ask the Lord to help you, he will. Defeating bad thoughts. No more fucking swearing, guys, okay? God damn it. No more fucking swearing. Hearts will cause good words and thoughts to come out of our mouths. It's almost so, Marty, as if our mouths will overflow. Yo, with what's up, base, Nick? The ideas that are inside of us. You know, we need to be very careful about what we put in our minds and our hearts, Marty. That's for sure. And most controversially... Ron, they were looking at some dirty pictures and they wanted me to look too. <gasps> well, Marty, what did you do? Well, I said, look, guys, I like you a lot and I want to play with you, but I can't look at those pictures. I just can't do it. Whether it was the lessons they taught or Marty's blatant uncanny. Hey, Amara, they were talking to you about looking at dirty pictures, dude. Yeah, they know. They know. Jesus knows what you're doing. And then Jesus put it inside this little doll that this dude has his fucking hand up his butt. To call you out right here. Yeah, you can't look at them titties, dude. Uh-uh. Venus. These two characters. It's a little terrifying. Yeah, dude, listen, I'm gonna be honest with you. Some dude like this is telling me about not looking... Jesus can get it too. If some doll like this is telling my seven-year-old about looking at bad photos and stuff, I'm going, what are you watching? No, no, put SpongeBob on. I don't care. I don't care if you get autism. You are not going to watch these freaks, dude. Uh-uh. Most vividly remembered part of the show. And this is important as these memories are essentially all we've been left with are still covered with that darkness and with that sin and when we say he'll wash us as white as snow that's referring to the sin that's within us the joy division is classified today mainly as lost media no official copies of the show have ever been published what the verse what lost media no official isn't this isn't Okay, never mind. My bad. Copies of the show have ever been published by. Remember when I said I was giving you a million dollars? Uh, no, Base Nick, you actually said that you were gonna give me a million dollars if I didn't do a one one handed push up, and you were like, "No, Chris, don't do the one handed push up." I was like, "Dude, I'm gonna do a one handed push up right now, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be based, dude." Okay, and I was gonna do one handed push up. You're like, "No, Chris, I'll give you a million dollars." If you if you do don't do a one handed push up, I was like I don't know, dude. I really want to do a one handed push up, and then and then you said you'd give me a million dollars and you'd get get me right. So I'm waiting for that million dollars, dude. Its creators or the networks that owned it. It just kind of ended one day and was never talked about again by those involved with the project. And this lack of archiving stretches past just the media itself. If you were to look online for information on the show today, you would find next to nothing. There's no Wikipedia page, no actors, producers, or directors mentioning it in what? their work history or on their resumes. There's no official website. There's essentially nothing. Not even so much as an official date in which the show started and ended, despite the fact that the show apparently ran for 20 long years. What? We know for sure that the show aired on CTN in the 1980s, specifically in the Tampa Bay area, before it was later syndicated and broadcast across the country on channels such as TVN and Smile of a Child. But today, none of these networks mention the show having ever aired in their lineups, and none of them have ever provided an explanation as to why the show was pulled from the air. The only reason we even know anything about it is thanks to old recordings and VHS tapes captured by those who once enjoyed the show. With a few dozen episodes and some short clips from the series having made their way to YouTube in recent oh. years, essentially serving as the only surviving relics of Joy Junction. Because of this, the show is largely a mystery, and information is incredibly scarce and hard to come by. But after doing some digging, I was able to find some mentions of it in old newspapers printed nearly 45 years ago that did shed a bit of light on the context surrounding its creation. The first mention of Joy Junction came in 1978 within the Evening Independent, though at this point it was not even a television show yet. Instead, advertisements were placed in the paper weekly for the Faith Community Church in Largo, Texas, that mentioned including some sort of in-person act specifically for children, called Joy Junction. 
It's unclear what this performance actually entailed, but coincidentally, just one year later, the show Joy Junction would begin filming in Largo, Florida, with these original performances likely serving as the inspiration and the basis for the show itself. Following this trail oh. of newspapers, I also found that the show was created by a company called WCLF, which began broadcasting back in October of 1979, with the founder of the company vaguely mentioning Joy Junction as an upcoming project. And sure enough, one week later, that same paper included a television guide that mentioned Joy Junction showing on TV for the very first time, giving us its likely premiere date of November 10th, 1979. Aside from this, I was able to confirm that the show did in fact play all across the United States and wasn't limited to just Florida, which might be why finding an exact date on when the show ended has proven essentially impossible. But the most common belief across the internet is that the show lasted until somewhere around 2004, putting its lifespan at a surprising 25 years, oh my which makes God. it all the more unusual that there's hardly any mention of it online, and that there was seemingly no attempt to ever even archive it. It seemed as if the parties involved didn't just drop the show and forget about it. They completely washed their hands of it and tried their best to bury it. There are even rumors circulating that CTN themselves had all their remaining copies set on fire and destroyed so that the show would forever be forgotten. And when you consider everything that happened, this isn't really all that surprising. But what is surprising is the extent of the unraveling and the way in which it began, as it all started with a simple water bottle. Huh? Rain? What? And when exactly the discovery was made, just that it was a terrible one. Police arrest a man under the suspicion of distributing CP. The puppet came to life, didn't it? Okay, so this is the Poppy Playtime backstory? Okay, yeah. Let me rewind here a little bit. Since me and Josh were making dumb little jokes. It's unknown when exactly the discovery was made, just that it was a terrible one. Police arrest a man under the suspicion of distributing CP, only to find numerous images depicting it on his hard drive, with the vast majority of the victims involved being impossible to identify, except for one. Within the background of one of the images lay a hidden clue, a water bottle displaying the name of a swim and scuba school in Johnson County, Kansas City. Police did a search of the area, asking for help identifying the victim, which led them to a young child who swiftly pointed out their abuser as being a man named Michael Arnett. Michael was immediately arrested, after which the true extent of his crime would be uncovered on his home computers. They contained countless photographs and videos depicting the same disturbing material, including a great deal that was produced by Michael himself. The contents of these images are genuinely some of the most appalling I've ever heard described, though we'll get more into that later, because there is something more relevant to this video that they found on his device. It was a lengthy online chat history with a man named Ronald Brown. And Ron, you're not one to talk. You're always on the telephone too. Well, I guess you've got a point there, Marty. Ronald's life was centered around three things, ventriloquism, Christianity, and children. His primary job was working as a traveling puppeteer with his show called Puppets Plus, working school events, birthday parties, and at local malls. He also hosted a weekly puppet show for his local congregation that he billed as being specifically for children. And of course, he had his role on Joy Junction. Every aspect of his life brought him in close proximity to children. And as it turns out, there were several undisclosed incidents that raised serious red flags about this. The first incident occurred in 1998, at a time when Joy Junction was still believed to be in circulation across TV stations. Brown was driving home late one evening when a police officer pulled him over for speeding. The officer shined his light in the car as Ronald reached for his documents, only for his light to catch something unusual stuck between the seat cushions. It was underwear. Children's underwear. Despite the alarming nature of this, Ronald would end up convincing the officer that nothing strange was going on, claiming that the old pair of briefs merely belonged to his puppet, Marty. That night, Ronald was allowed to drive away without further questioning. Though things get stranger from here. Around the time of this encounter, Ronald had been living in a home conveniently located less than a block away from a popular playground. And upon moving into this home, neighbors began to complain of Ronald's relationship with young children in the area. Every Wednesday, kids from around the block would ride their scooters and their bikes over to his house for free pizza. What? The group would eventually emerge from the home, and Ronald would drive them in his van to a nearby church, what? where he would supposedly perform his ventriloquism. Uh, hey, by the way, these activities were the activities that the boomers in Tom McDonald's comment section were talking about. It was awesome when it used to happen. Zach Josh 
Justice. <laughs> nah, dude, I was making a callback to another to another react we did last night. The fucking boomers in the Tom McDonald comment section be like, yeah, I grew up. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. We could do whatever we want. We went all through the neighborhood. It was safe. This is the safe neighborhoods they were talking about, by the way. These weekly meetups were strange, to say the least, especially because they were allegedly fairly secretive with some children. Dude, it was, brother, I'll tell you what, it was awesome back when I was a kid, okay? We didn't know anything about no PDF file, okay? They just existed among us. We didn't know who was who or anything because there was no... World Wide Web or news to tell us about <laughs> who is a PDF file and might hurt our children. Okay, it was awesome. Okay, that's that's what those motherfuckers were saying the other night. Oh my god. Uh, back in my day, our parents just let us walk into a guy's home for free pizza, and then he drive us around in his van. Oh my god. ...and even sneaking off to meet the man without telling their parents. Oh. There were even other allegations that Ronald himself had hid their bikes underneath his home, almost as if he was trying to avoid any suspicion. And although I couldn't find concrete proof of this, it was rumored that when neighbors checked underneath his home, they reported not only finding these bikes, but used sex toys as well, which were stashed there for unknown reasons. There were never any sort of allegations made against Ron, legal or otherwise, but the red flags- Ooh, bet, bet. The the black phone? Is that what's- that's literally the name of the movie? Bro, my kids are gonna have trackers on everything. They are not going to hang out with some creepy dude. Oh, God. ...here are glaring. Red flags that seemingly went ignored, as people bought into Ronald's act as a God-fearing, silly ventriloquist. Though in reality, the chats found on the computer of Michael Arnett shattered this perception in the most dramatic way imaginable. Though even so, these chats aren't what you would expect. No, somehow they are much, much worse. No. All right, obviously, trigger warning. Oh, I don't feel comfortable reading them out loud. Oh, here you go, chat. Yeah, I ain't reading that shit either. Oh! Within their conversations were numerous messages between the two men, fantasizing about not only killing children, but eating them as well, with most of the messages being far too vile to discuss or even show in this video. And this wasn't just fascination, it was obsession. Ronald had even found a child at his church that he frequently discussed wanting to eat, mentioning that he would be the perfect feast for Easter, describing what it would be like to end his life. For Easter?! All right, well, now we know why they, uh, now we know why they, uh, they were like, yep, we are burning the tapes of this, of this show. Holy shit, dude. Nah, this is, this is vile. This is legitimately vile. Yo, what's up, Fardhead? So sorry you're joining in at a weird time right now, dude. We're watching a video about, uh, the children's TV show with a dark secret is what this show is, or what this, uh, video is titled. We're at the, like, pinnacle consume his body. And this went far past just talking, as Brown had taken photos of the child from afar and had actually been formulating a plan to kidnap him. He had even sent a photo of the child with black lines drawn over it to show the various spots in which Ronald wanted to butcher him. This was all supported by his friend Michael too, who himself claimed to have eaten multiple children, with a man even sending a photo of a two-year-old girl that was seen inside of a pot, <coughs> inside of an oven. And this ain't, wasn't the end of the shocking... Ain't no way you just played the oof sound at that. Ain't no fucking way, bro. Long time no see. Yes, yeah, sir. How have you been, Fardhead? What's new, brother? Discoveries either. As things were made even worse upon investigators searching into Ronald's username, UE Lime. 
In doing so, they discovered an account on a website called cutedeadguys.net, which was and is a forum for sharing images of the dead between those who fetishize corpses. And within his account, Ronald stated that he was one of these people too, admitting that he loved the sight of dead boys ever since he was a young man. And he wasn't lying either. Upon these revelations, Ronald's home was raided where police would find over 200 images containing CP, which didn't even include the hundreds of others showing tied up children, children being abused, and children that appeared to be dead. Along with this, police also found a blow-up sex doll in the home that was dressed in little boy's clothing. And inside one of his sock drawers was another hard drive with images of countless dead children, as well as a single flyer for a missing child in the area. What? He also had hundreds of images of a young boy named Andrew who had attended Brown's church and youth group with the boy having died of a brain tumor years before photos that showed the boy's slow physical decline all the way until his memorial service. You know, Ron, you have to invite Jesus Christ to come into your heart and ask him to forgive you of your sin. Upon his arrest, Ronald Brown admitted to everything. He truly did want to eat the child he had been eyeing up at his church, along with many others over the years. Though after saying this, he claimed that he would never actually have carried through with it and that Michael and him were merely role-playing. This is heavily debated to this day, as technically there isn't proof that any of these delusions spilled over to the real world, but that's only what we know of. And considering the large quantity of CP in his home, the self-admitted obsession with dead little boys, and the actual plans he had to kidnap and eat a child, it seemed clear that it was only a matter of time before he finally followed through with his desires. For Ronald, there was no defense. And because of this, the judge handed down a sentence of 20 years in 2014 which would wind up becoming a life sentence. Yo. <laughs> Is it a, 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 I'm gonna mess up your name. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome in. <laughs> why did I make my... Why did I make my follow sound effect a vine boom? Why did I make that a vine boom? Why would I do that, dude? I hope the kid is okay these days like i would live in fear if i learned a dude was stalking me and trying to eat me yeah dude absolutely link i'm so sorry that happened to you i'm saying you love homie um this is wild bro yeah this is so crazy i yeah i don't want to even joke about anything at all even not to do with this case right now dude this is crazy sentence of 20 years in 2014 which would wind up becoming a also 20 years that's it that's all they're gonna give to this like literal monster life sentence as it appears he passed away sometime in 2020 well before his scheduled release thank god this discovery changed the entire context surrounding Joy Junction, the wholesome TV show beloved by children all across the country, only for one of its main stars to be outed as a predator of the most disturbing caliber. But there was one last discovery made by law enforcement in Ronald's case that makes the show that much more chilling. No way. During the raid on Ronald's home, officers found a collection of journals that Ronald wrote in daily, where he obsessively discussed young boys that he had been coming into contact with highlighting his desire to know what it was like to kill them and to know how they taste. These journals, to my knowledge, have never been released to the public. But the thing I find most interesting about this is the date at which these journals started, 1978, meaning that this disturbing desire had been brewing inside of him for decades. And coincidentally, Joy Junction just so happened to start one year later in 1979, oh. meaning that many of the kids seen on this program were likely the very same ones that Ronald wanted to eat. Oh, sorry, just in case you guys missed it because of my dumb face being here. Now on this program, were likely the very same ones that Ronald wanted to eat. Given this context, it's no wonder why all parties involved with Joy Junction cut ties with it completely. It just changes the entire feeling of the show. From the moment that one simple water bottle was identified, Joy Junction's fate was sealed, and so was Ronald Brown's. Still though, I'm left with many questions after reviewing this case. Was there anything more to that traffic stop in 1998 or those pizza parties with the kids? And how serious was Ronald about following through with his plans to kill C? With the answer to these questions likely being taken to the grave along with him. But what I find so fascinating about this case is that the fallout of the raid on Michael Arnett's home is still being felt to this very day. 
Honest devices weren't just chats from Ronald Brown. In fact, there were hundreds of other predators, with officers going on to arrest many of them, some of whom are still in the process of being tried and sentenced. And when reading into some of these other cases involving Michael, it's evident just how Eight years?! That's all they gonna give this dude? Eight?! ...and sentenced. And when reading into some of these other cases involving Michael, it's evident just how serious these people were about their dark cravings. One of these men was even recently caught having built an entire bunker equipped with torture tools in preparation for his first victim, which he planned to share with Michael. What? On top of all the CP distribution, these fantasies about killing children weren't just role play. These were very real thoughts and very real plans. But the one small bright spot of this case is that the two-year-old girl that Michael had photographed in his oven thankfully was found alive and well. And he too never got to carry through with eating a child, at least that we know. But his physical abuse against them was in fact very real. And as were his desires, desires that him and Ronald likely would have acted on had this entire ring never been exposed. When it was conceived, Joy Junction was meant to teach children morals, right from wrong. But ironically, many of these lessons just so happened to be taught by a man who was actively engaging in the very behaviors that were condemned by Joy Junction. Ron, they Mom! were looking at some dirty pictures and they wanted me to look too. As your companions, you should have friends who have pure and clean thoughts and will only give you good ideas. With his actions forever tainted- I'm gonna be honest. Um, this could like totally open up an entire conversation about how people in any form of a religion try to like basically play God here. Like these, these dudes were really trying to be like, oh yeah, we're, we're more connected to God than you. So we can say what's good. Yeah. Let's get the ventriloquist that also knows what's good with God in here. And, uh, he can also tell these kids what is wrong and right oh he's been doing what for 40 years like crazy dude sorry 20 25 years 30 years painting the show and condemning it to a lifetime of obscurity remembered only for the man and his puppet who brought the whole thing down as a matter of fact there's something 30 years here right now really that's right don't go away kid joy junction is coming right back Fucking insane, bro. Well, um, thanks, Nick Crowley, for telling us this wild shit. Your COD clips on TikTok? Uh, yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, let's, let's jump over to that. All these kids these days swearing it's terrible. Proceeds to talk about killing and eating like a, a German fairy tale. German fairy tale? Damn, bro. The urge to puke? Yeah. Kind of makes you feel bad for the rest of the cast of that show who probably had good intentions and had to have their legacy destroyed. I guess so. Uncle was one of the children on the show. He was only seven years old and didn't understand the horrible acts until he was older. If any anyone ever asks him about, he goes quiet. The fact that Ronald Martin might have thought about eating him probably still haunts him. 20 years for that? Just 20? Are you kidding me? That's a slap in the face and a mockery to society. Dude, yeah. There's something so sickly Iconic about someone giving a lesson to kids to not look at porn and then getting caught with some of the most vile, disgusting, and degenerate porn imaginable. Yeah. 